from the cable easel with this program of painting and drawing from life and when we don't paint and draw or when I don't paint and draw from life uh, from setups in the studio uh, there is a, a technique here called a monitor uh, landscape painting and so a crew goes out that's me on the camera man goes out and we find a place and uh, set the scene and shoot it and then bring it back into the uh, studio and project it on the monitor that's the closest that anybody can get to being out of doors and as you can see when you uh, when you look at the monitor sometimes there are people and the wind is blowing the flag and the cars pass by and people stop and so on so you know that it's live and that I'm not copying a still picture which is sometimes what is seen on some of these programs just copying another picture this is from life and so uh, we're foraging into uh, another area uh, this is in Nassau County in an absolutely charming place called Roslyn it uh, goes way way back in the history of Long Island it was settled a long long time ago and this is called the bell tower uh, I'm going to do this program in two parts because it uh, requires more time than just a half an hour to do a decent study of anything at all so uh, this bell tower in Roslyn is a, uh, a, a so, sort of a remarkable piece of architecture. It's on way on the top of a hill, and if there weren't trees in the way, you would see a uh, view of the harbor, and uh, then Connecticut, uh, then of course beyond that the Sound, and then beyond that is Connecticut shoreline. And so on the north shore of Long Island, in a place called Roslyn, this is where this particular scene is taking place. Um, the day that this was done, it was very windy and very beautiful and crystal clear, and fall is upon us, and here we are. Uh, this, I wrote down uh, while I was there what is written above the door of this structure, and while I'm uh, working, I think I will just simply tell you about it. It's, um, it, is co it, it says, uh, carved in, uh, it looks to me like um, uh, redstone or um, pink stone, uh, known in New York City as brownstone, but it's actually pinkstone. Um, it says, in loving memory of Ellen E. Ward, A.D. 1895. Uh, before, uh, and so while I'm doing this, I'm going to lay this out, and let me just interrupt for a moment about my telling you. The first thing I'm going to do is to straighten out the tower. I do believe that when this scene was shot, now, either the tower leans or the camera was slightly uh, off to the side. I'm not sure which. Uh, the chances are that the tower is straight, otherwise it wouldn't have been standing all these years, and that we did, in fact, find ourselves leaning a little bit. So I'm going to straighten it out by giving the center, the center line of the post, which is, of course, the plumb line in, in architecture, and then to, to, to lay out, as best I can architecturally, this interesting and uh, strange, not the most beautiful structure there is. I mean, it certainly is not um, uh, the Tuileries Gardens, and it is not one of the more beautiful uh, architectural uh, feats uh, in America, but it certainly is what you w would find free to call interesting. Uh, it's made of um, rather large uh, stones. I believe they probably were imported because Long Island doesn't have that kind of stone. They look like, uh, indeed, granite. And um, 
If they are granite, they probably came from uh, distant places such as Maine and so on. But uh, we're looking at this uh, from underneath because you can, can't get very far away from this tower and uh, you are therefore compelled to look at it from below. And uh, that's, what, that's what this shot is from. So uh, remembering that in order to do an architectural uh, rendering and a painting at the same time, uh, the effort has to be made so that it is um, architecturally comprehensible and also correct. If you don't have it correct, somebody is going to uh, find something terribly wrong with it and they're going to say it's all off kilter and we don't know why but it really looks terrible. So uh, you have to apply as much uh, technique as you can as far as architectural understanding is concerned and uh, that way uh, that's the reason that I say that when you begin to do architectural paintings uh, involved in landscape painting, uh, a certain amount of drawing has got to be uh, enforced. Uh, um, there is no question that uh, trees don't particularly care whether you make them a little bit fuzzier or a little bit less fuzzy, fuzzy than normal. Uh, but you know what cares? Buildings. Buildings care a great deal, and so do the viewers. They may not always know what's wrong with it, but if the building is askew, then the painting simply does not work. Um, as you can see, I'm laying this out in masses and forms that they are. These are all shapes, and they will, um, they'll be painting over them, of course, but this is the general layout. If you don't have a layout, you don't have a plan, you are going to find yourself in severe trouble by placing things. Uh, architecturally, uh, because we're looking at it from below and looking at it, the perspective lines begin to change as it gets down toward the street and here they're pretty much at eye level. Now uh, here are these um, these boxwoods. They must be quite old uh, and I'll tell you more about dates as far as the um, uh, uh, the area is concerned because I wrote them down being something of a trying to be something of a, a recording a re uh, re reporter an artistic reporter and so it says underneath her name on the front door of this uh, building it says uh, in loving memory of Ellen E. Ward, 1880-1895, to whom the people and Rosalind were dear. Uh, she fell asleep January 18th, 18 something or other. Uh, the, um, there's the shot. The uh, pollution or vandals or just plain wear and tear has obliterated the last two numbers in the year of her death. Uh, so it was more than likely 1890. Four, maybe it took a few years for this uh, to be built in her memory. But she must have been a lady who either had uh, a lot of uh, time to devote to the people, or she was a character, such as some of us are, or she uh, was a volunteer worker, or she uh, gave money to charitable causes. Whatever Ellen Ward did, uh, I would appreciate anybody who knows to write to me and tell me what they know about the life of this lady who has the clock tower uh, built in her memory. Uh, with the charming saying about she fell asleep on January the 18th in 1895. Um, the American flag flies outside, which obviously means that uh, it is being maintained by somebody. Uh, and the, uh, the boxwoods that I'm now laying in, in this painting are very well maintained. And it dominates uh, the top of the hill as you uh, approach Rosalind from the east. Um, it's something of a traffic hazard, as a matter of pure fact. Um, uh, there are traffic lights, there is a cross uh, traffic problem going on, and a tremendous amount of activity in this place which, uh, which is a memorial. Actually, it's as busy as any street in New York. Um, I found myself having to dodge the traffic uh, when I was there. Now here is the here's a nice layout. The, the the dominant subject matter in the painting is right here over slightly off center, which is what it ought to be. I am going to use artistic license and eliminate once and for all and completely the telephone lines, of which there is a maze. It looks like well, it looks like a bucket full of yarn. There is so much of it out there. So I'm going to eliminate that, and I'm going to stick in here at approximately the level of these windows. And these are the points of reference that I'm trying to talk about. If you don't know where to place something, you have to find the reference point. And the, this building over here to the right, which I think is a, um, 
is a little uh, government or an official building. Um, it's just sort of peeking out. It's a little white building of a different era, a different time, but um, it's part of this uh, general scene. So here, here is the here is what you need. This is the component for the composition. The flag flies uh, right here in this little park that is on the other side of the tower. And uh, the, um, the wind was blowing well enough to keep that flag in motion a good deal of the time. So here we have a layout. Uh, there is no doubt that a layout is going to be more than helpful. Now, I, I'm going to take back a little bit of what I said about the telephone lines. There is a rather intriguing, old, and totally comp crazy looking uh, telephone pole here that doubles as a phone pole and a light pole and it kind of is going to act like a frame for all of this activity going on here and we can in fact cross the painting with a few very subtle uh, lines and uh, these will all get painted over but, uh, but I can tell you that sometimes this helps first of all uh, to document the time in history uh, if I had no wires at all this could probably double for a painting that may have been done uh, when there were no life no, no no wires at all but I must say the uh, the, the number of them was pretty staggering and I guess the city fathers don't really pay that much attention when they give the okay to putting up these incredible numbers of wires. So here we go. Uh, this was a uh, brilliantly clear day, not a cloud in the sky, lots of wind, uh, crisp and clear, and here is the beginning of applying paint to canvas. I'm working with a, uh, uh, a canvas board, all of these um, um, uh, well, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I have twelve, including the white, a dozen colors. If you can't do a, if you can't do a study with a dozen colors, uh, then there's something wrong with you. I think that you need more than the five uh, or six that are used on the other pro on the other programs. There is one program that has a man that um, mixes colors on a palette with only uh, five colors and white, and it's. Um, well, it makes for uh, his type of painting, which, in my opinion, loses a little bit in the in in the um, in the lack of variety of pigments and colors that he uses. Uh, I also do not use a four foot wide uh, wall painting brush. I believe that one applies paint in a deliberate manner. And small strokes are by far always the better. I use uh, bristle brushes made of sable. Uh, the um, the brushes that are made out of the uh, stiff bristles are um, simply don't apply well in my technique of being uh, a detail painter of landscapes. And so the um, the uh, sable brushes are the ones that I much prefer. Uh, as the sky uh, is dark at the top because it's uh, got a lot more, well, uh, optically it is a far deeper blue. And as it comes down towards the horizon, it begins to lighten. And the way that happens is by blending as you go along. I'm using, and uh, because um, I think that it's wise to always tell people how I work these things, I'm using ultramarine blue, a touch of cobalt and white, and a uh, little bit of te a tempering color of orange to, to uh, lower the value and not make it look like it's one of those neon uh, colors. And approximately this is where I would say I should start blending from the darker blue. Well, actually, I could probably make this very much more dramatic and make it equally as dark blue as I uh, seem, uh, as the monitor tells me it is. It's, uh, it's quite a remarkable um, tone and it's just uh, it just needs to be a little bit deeper at the uh, at the top of the uh, top of the sky as if there was such a thing as top of the sky actually when we say up there in the sky I always find that sort of amusing because we know perfectly well that it's not up there it's out there and uh, so it's um, out there, uh, up, we don't quite, I'm not sure that we on this planet know exactly what we mean by up, because it certainly is not up, it's out. Uh, and throw, throw something hard enough and it will not go up and come down, it'll just keep going. That means you, I mean, you have to throw it hard enough for make it keep going. However, uh, we're not, we're not, this is not a science program, this is a trying to analyze painting as a part of one's life uh, in observing the landscape around us. Um, uh, working with the place that's the farthest away from you uh, and working towards the foreground is the technique. And also the technique means to uh, apply the, um, the kind of uh, time, diligence, and uh, patience that one needs to apply with small strokes. 
I think that uh, one of the reasons that the paintings that you see around me uh, are um, appreciated as um, possibly you could call it fine arts is that they are done with deliberate strokes and there is some attention being paid to what happens from life. Um, life meaning what is happening out there. All right, let me, uh, I'm now going to discontinue the use of the ultramarine blue, and I'm going to just concentrate on using some of the cobalt with possibly, I'm not sure that I'm going to put a touch of the yellow green in it, but I have to get to, to the paler color as I come down towards the horizon. And as you can see, I can blend this in just a little bit later. Um, if there is a break in the line here, I can, I can blend it as I go along. But but uh, I want to make uh, it absolutely clear that the reason that I paint this way is to avoid the look that one sees in some of these uh, other programs. The paintings do not look as though they've been hand painted. They look as though they've been either airbrushed or done on a multiple belt system uh, with an enormous uh, wall painting brush. And I, um, I find that I uh, sort of uh, recoil at the look of paintings that do that. Uh, I must say that I think that the public is probably recoiling also subliminally because every yard sale that I go to, there are those uh, paintings uh, for sale for the price of the frame. So the paintings have now got no value whatsoever, not even in yard sales. And uh, so my, my little, my little uh, semi uh, war against uh, that type of, uh, of technique is beginning to produce some results in the way those paintings are being received. Um, I grant you that uh, to, to produce an enormous picture in the space of uh, uh, 40 minutes means that you probably have to use some kind of a wildly uh, uh, um, time cutting uh, technique, but I would think that I would rather not. Uh, of course, uh, these are in fact only demonstrational pieces. They are not what you would call finished works. And when I prepare them for uh, the Art for Open Lands sales, which takes place in the spring, I refine them. But now they are going to merely uh, behave like demonstration pieces. And seeing as how I'm going to just clean my brush of this um, blue color for a while, I'm going to take a short break, uh, but uh, don't do much more because I'll be right back. back again uh, and a short break is always nice because then I can clean my brushes and clean my glasses and so on. So here we have the very beginning of a landscape painting. Obviously the beginning is the sky and uh, when it is a simple sky like that one can one can just uh, uh, use it in the simplest possible way of trying to get the blend. The blend is one of the more fascinating things about landscape paintings, especially when you uh, w when it is on a um, in a uh, landscape that needs a tremendous amount of attention paid to something else. In other words, you keep the sky extremely simple if you're if that's the day, and then you uh, you devote the complexity uh, of the uh, of the painting to the subject matter, which in this case is extremely complex because it's this structure. Interesting as it is, it is a complex little structure. However, working from back to front, this is only the first part of the um, of this program that is going to span two half-hour shows, and this is the first 
the first part one. Now, with a little bit of pigment, I'm going to, and as you can tell by, uh, by consulting the, um, the subject matter, uh, the trees in the background here, swaying in the, in the wind, uh, have a particular anatomy of their own. They are not just, um, uh, you know, I don't just slap the brush against the canvas and hope that it looks like a tree. I have to be able to make sure that uh, that tree is identified as whatever kind of a tree it is. It looks to me as though it might be an, um, well, one of those, uh, either a maple that is beginning uh, to shed its, uh, it's going to shed its leaves within the next few weeks or so, but it is um, still got plenty for the branches to be blowing in the wind, and uh, it's, um, I do believe it's a maple. Uh, there is a pine here, and there's some boxwood in the foreground, but um, the identification of the trees is sort of uh, vital to the identification of the scene, because if you just put any old kind of a, of a tree in here, uh, whoever is familiar with this spot, is not going to be able to recognize it merely for the foliage. We are very reliant upon foliage to um, identify places that we know. Um, uh, I mean, it, obviously, if I were to stick a palm tree in here, it would be totally unrecognizable. So trees have a, uh, a, a definite role to play in these landscape paintings and be sure, and anybody who decides to do landscape paintings must be aware of the fact that the um, the greenery around has got to make sense uh, for that particular space. So, um here, this, this becomes a little bit paler as, as it goes away. This is farther down the hill than this, so uh, the color becomes less intense. Maybe it's a little bit too subtle for the, um, for the t television screen, but I do believe that I have made it a little bit less intense. And these are, um, this is uh, greeneries going further and further away, and maybe even becoming even less visible as they become, uh, and here are some trees as they become, and they've lost some of their detail, and they're now just nothing more than they look like cutouts uh, that are going off into the distance. There's a touch of purple in them because they are in fact going away from us. So um, I like to make sure that the atmosphere is taken care of. So a touch of them of mauve in there, which is of course spectrum, oops, too much. Uh, spectrum violet is a color that you must use at all times when you do landscape painting. All green is, is tempered. A uh, green color is tempered by, uh, by mauve and or orange. So um, these are little pieces of information that one ought to know about color mixing. And it comes with experience as well as a little bit of preliminary information, all available in any book on oil painting that has a color wheel in it. If you see an oil book on painting that does not have a color wheel, then it's a, pho it's a phony, and go to the next one that has a color wheel, because all explanation of color mixing can be done through the mere uh, uh, perusal, a little bit at a time, of color wheels. They will, it is very clear, it's exactly the same kind of information that tells you that omelets are made from eggs. And, um, and once you have that information in your hand, you can be the world's great chef. So here we have a color wheel. Uh, also, uh, a color wheel information that you must pay attention to. I'm going to be using a little bit um, a, a deeper tone here because there seems to be a tree that is caught in rather intense shadow and it's, uh, it's um, behind this little, uh, this little white structured building and it seems to be uh, cast in shadow from some other um, uh, uh, reason uh, that this is in, in dark shadow, but it's a nice dramatic part of this side of the painting, all of this being very dark here, meaning that I'm going to be able to uh, bank on that darkness to give you a definite outline of that little building. Well. Um, for the, for, for uh, all intents and purposes, the layout of this particular uh, background, which is going to make way for the painting of the tower. Now, when you paint rocks, it is uh, a very different technique than painting just about anything else. It has to be comprehensible and also has to be recognizable. In other words, it has to look like rocks. Uh, whether they're set in mortar or whether they're sitting on the edge of a, of a beach or the uh, edge of a, of a mountain or a cliff, they must look like rocks, otherwise you have failed in the purpose of 
painting rocks. These are set in mortar, obviously, and they have a, uh, they have a uh, texture. But uh, the thing to avoid is to make them look like uh, they have been outlined, e each one individually. Therefore, uh, a lot of has to be eliminated. And I think that as I proceed with this, that, com that understanding will become clearer and clearer. The basis of, this, of the color of this rock in the sunlight is, even though we know that it's granite and we assume that it's got to be so, sort of gray, the basic color of those um, of those stones in this tower is a kind of a mauvish, uh, well, it's a sort of a mauvish amber tone, and I'm going to put it too dark. Let me find some more white. White is the main color that you use the most of, and so you always squeeze out a very generous amount. Unfortunately, I can tell you that color prices have gone up. This tube of oil paint now costs $8.75, which is sort of staggering, but that's what you need when you're going to be painting oils, and oils last a lifetime and beyond. If they are painted in oils, if they're painted in acrylics, nobody is quite sure how long they will last. And so for that, uh, there, there's my particular uh, prejudice against, uh, against acrylics, uh, based on the fact that nobody has really been able to figure out how long they're going to last. I do know one thing, they dry too fast, and you can't get the kind of blend that you want, so that's why I avoid them. Okay, I don't have enough pink in this, uh, in this uh, mixture for these uh, rocks. Uh, and I'm, going to, I'm using a little bit of alizarin crimson and another touch of some of the uh, yellow. There, that's more like it. That's a far better tone for the sunny side of this tower. Uh, obviously, there are two, two colors involved, the sunny side and the shade side. Uh, I like to put the whole tone in as a base color and then work the stones in in a, uh, in a technique which is uh, very individual to each painter. Uh, but I think that, um, I think that uh, whatever tips I can give you, you will find that the job of, of painting uh, stones might be a little bit less, um, well, daunting. It's rather intimidating when you have to face painting uh, something with that definite a, um, a pattern to it. Uh, the tower uh, is, um, is orange and rose in, in tone, so, I suppose that the sunny side of this of this roof line is going to be quite bright, and and it can be uh, put in right now, even though uh, I'm working on the stones. Uh, the t time, of course, being what it is, uh, always runs away, and uh, there's o always the problem of how do you uh, how do you uh, do as much as you want to in a short period of time. The the period of time is going to come to an end maybe with the painting of a few more things here, such as the, um, the dark side of the underneath part of this, which is one of the reasons that I found myself really interested in, in this view, is because underneath there is um, there's a wonderful dramatic darkness uh, that takes place under here, and it looks almost like a Chinese roof. I think that you'll agree that all of this really deep tone is, uh, oh, the sky is missing in there. I've got to put that one in. I'll put that one in the next time. But the deep tones here are what gives it its dramatic um, uh, lighting. It was about 12 noon uh, when this was shot, and um, you can see that uh, the shadows are extremely, are extremely sharp and very deep and very rich. And that's one of the things that makes paintings like this uh, so intriguing is the dr drama of the shadows. And that's why when the sun is out and we go out on these shoots, uh, always, always more than glad, and it's essential that the sun be out and, and produce these uh, very dramatic shadows. So um, with the bell tower of uh, Roslyn uh, as the project for this particular uh, um, uh, program. Uh, the next one uh, that uh, for hopefully is going to be programmed so that it will be it will follow uh, this one consecutively so that you'll be able to pick this up let's say on a Tuesday and the following one will be on a on a Wednesday uh, then you'll be able to follow this um, uh, you know with make, make, making some sense out of it. So here we have it uh, the beginning of uh, Rosalind's bell clock, clock tower it's called the clock tower dedicated to Ella Ward. Uh, anybody who knows who Miss Ward was, they can call or write, and we'd be glad to hear from it. Uh, don't forget, tune in the next time. It's been great fun to be here for this short space, and uh, do tune in again for the conclusion of this painting. Bye-bye, Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel. Thanks for watching.